Darwin, Peacocks, and Beauty. The John 1010 Project uh, recently came out with a video, and I'm going to show about the first three and a half minutes or so of it. Um, it can be found at the website that's there. And let me see if I can get it to work here. Uh, we'll play about the first three and a half minutes. eight million different species of animals and plants. And for more than a century, the go-to explanation for their incredible diversity has been the theory of natural selection. Charles Darwin's hypothesis of gradual, undirected biological change has had enormous influence on both science and philosophy. Yet can a purely materialistic process actually account not only for the stunning variety of living organisms, but also for their extravagant beauty. I think the place to start with natural selection and beauty is Darwin himself. He wrote once that every time he saw the tail of a peacock, it made him physically ill, sick to his stomach. Because he's looking at something that goes well beyond what his theories, either of natural selection or sexual selection, can explain. To better understand Darwin's concerns about beauty, peacocks, and their threat to his theory, let's take a closer look at those feathers. You see the peacock's tail and you go, wow. It's a visual crescendo of symmetry, harmony, coordination among all the elements of the design. And the deeper you look, the more interesting it becomes. An adult male peacock has, on average, about 200 individual tail feathers. 170 of them feature a decorative eye spot. And 30 are crowned with a wing-shaped plume called a T. When displayed during courtship, the feathers form a magnificent fan. Where every eye spot and T are uniformly spaced and geometrically balanced, to create a showcase of pattern, symmetry, precision, and design. This bird is a living, breathing work of art. And when we move in close to the details, we see craftsmanship and planning and subtle engineering that's just utterly obvious. The shape of every eye spot is defined by rows of multicolored branching strands called barbs. Moving closer, we see that each barb contains thousands of barbules, microscopic filaments tightly compacted along a rigid shaft. And the surface of each barbule is segmented into crystal-like bands of molecular jewelry. These barbules are reflective, so they glimmer and change color when struck by light from different angles. The total effect of all this decoration provides an excellent example of what is known as gratuitous beauty. That's beauty that goes way beyond what's needed to attract a mate or to provide some other survival advantage. In other words, you have features that look like they're there for no other reason than to be gorgeous, to be beautiful, to be breathtaking. The rest of the video, look at it, it's a very good one. But uh, uh, let's see if I got there we are. Uh, did Darwin actually say that? Well, if you believe the internet, and you know, the internet's always right, 
He did. <clears throat> this is a Darwin in a letter to A.C. Gray about 1860. It is curious that I remember well when the thought of the eye made me cold all over. But I've got over this stage of the complaint, and now small trifling particulars of structure often make me very uncomfortable. The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. And then he goes on to talk about black pigs, which, by the way, apparently because of their black coloration can eat black root without getting poisoned. Don't ask me. Um, uh, that uh, letter in its entirety, including the note that explains about the black pigs, um, can be found at uh, Darwin Project. Um, and um, what about that quote about uh, it would destroy my theory? Well, let's look in at um, the sixth edition of The Origin of Species. Interestingly enough, the sixth edition is entitled The Origin of Species, whereas the first edition is entitled On the Origin of Species, which is interesting. Um, and again, you can get this, uh, you know, somebody obviously taken off of printing, uh, Gutenberg.org. Um, this is, uh, I think, page 188. The foregoing remarks lead me to say a few words on the protest lately made by some naturalists against the utilitarian doctrine that every detail of structure has been produced for the good of its pro 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 possessor. Basically, a doctrine of selfishness. They believe that many structures have been created for the sake of beauty, to delight man or the creator, but this latter point is beyond the scope of scientific discussion, or for the sake of mere variety, as you already discussed. Such doctrines, if true, would be absolutely fatal to my theory. Keep that in mind. Beauty kills Darwin. If it really exists and is not a byproduct of uh, usefulness for the organism itself. So, if those beautiful feathers on the peacock don't help the peacock somehow survive or reproduce, then they are a direct argument against Darwin. There was a um, paper by Takahashi et al. in 2008 entitled Peahens Do Not Prefer Peacocks with More Elaborate Trains. It's an animal behavior. There's the reference end again. You can get this online. You can check it out. Of interest, it was received on the 7th of September 2006 and the and the initial acceptance is the 13th of October, 2006. And the final acceptance is a year later. Finally got around to be publishing on the 20th of February of 2008. Keep that in mind. Over a year from the time it was received until it finally was accepted. They had a hard time with this paper. The abstract reads, the elaborate train of male Indian peafowl, Pavo cristatus, is thought to have evolved in response to female mate choice and maybe an indicator of good genes. The aim of this study was to investigate the role of the male train in mate choice using male and female-centered observations in a feral population of Indian peafowl in Japan over seven years. So these have been transported to Japan, had escaped out into the wild, and were happily living. We found no evidence that peahens expressed any pref preference for peacocks with more elaborate trains, for uh, that is, trains having more ocelli, eyes, a more symmetrical arrangement, or greater length, similar to other studies of galliform showing that females disregarded uh, disregard male plumage. This is not just a feature of peacocks. It's a feature of all um, galliforms. Combined with previous results, our findings indicate that the peacock's train one is not the universal target of female choice. Two shows small variance among males across populations. They all look pretty much the same. 
And three, based on current physiological knowledge, does not appear to reliably reflect the male condition. You can't tell a peacock's health by its tail. By his tail, I should say. We also found that some behavioral characteristics of peacocks during displays were largely affected by female behaviors and were spuriously correlated with male mating success. Although the male train and its direct display toward a female seems necessary for successful reproduction, if you don't show it, it's not going to happen, um, we conclude the peahens in this population are likely to exercise active choice based on cues other than the peacock's train. Why is this important? Because remember, if the peacock's train is not selected for, then it's just there. And Darwin cannot explain it. But beauty can. The striking contrast of showy male and sober female birds in nature is sometimes rather puzzling. This is the beginning of their paper. Darwin proposed the idea of sexual selection through female mate choice to explain why such patterns of sex differences in appearance have evolved in animals, and many behavioral ecologists have applied his idea to explain conspicuous extravagant plumage ornaments in male birds, which are fairly common. Um, sexual selection is generally expected to be strong in species with highly skewed mating success among males, such as lek breeding birds. Uh, what in the world is lek breeding birds? Well, leks are um, where all the males find themselves kind of lined up in a in a row or in a group anyway, and the female birds birds get to wander around and make their choice of mate, and the males of course try to strut their stuff, um, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that happens with, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the names of them, the, oh boy, the, a number of uh, galliforms in the United States that, that, that do that and in, a, in other places in the world. And um, in these species, the tight coevolution of female mate preferences and male sexual displays seem particularly plausible because this relationship explains bo both why only males of the species have ornaments and why only few males achieve mating with females. However, reviews have revealed that male plumage ornaments in general are not always accompanied by strong sexual selection. And there's a review. And that the trend is similar for lecking birds despite their large potential for sexual selection. Yep. Um, perhaps counterintuitively, numerous studies have experienced difficulties in identifying the cues that cause variations in males mating among males on leks. Whereas few studies have found male plumage ornaments to be the primary cues used by females in mate choice on leks. They show all this wonderful stuff and the bird, females look at something else. Researchers have achieved exceptional success in explaining male plumage ornaments in Indian peafowl which is an exception to that rule, um, as the direct target of female choice. To date, the Peter Cox train has been proposed not only as a target of current female choice, and there's a reference, but also as an indicator of good genes, and there's another reference. However, there may be at least four problems with these hypotheses. First, Male trained morphology seems not to be the universal cue of choice because there's evidence both for and against the effect of male trained morphology on male mating success. Successful peacocks are individuals either with or without longer trains and with or without a greater number of eye spots. The trait itself does not seem to be the single cue for choice. Several peafowl researchers have pointed out the functional importance of behavioral cues. How they act is more important than how they look. Uh, if people would only do that sometimes? No. Um, second, the ways in which females assess male trains, unless females have the ability to count eye spots per se, have been questioned repeatedly, but have not been fully investigated. Third, there is no consensus on which trains characterize males with the most elaborate trains. Is it bigger? Is it uh, more eyes? Uh, what, what, what's going on? Petrie and colleagues have reported relationships between 
the number of eye eye spots and male mating success, uh, Petri and and so forth, Uh, the train length and male survival, the train mass and number of eggs produced per male. Notice that Petri is finding all these things. Um, The area of eye spots and growth rate and survival of offspring. Bigger eye spots, your kids live longer, I guess. Um, <clears throat> the proportion of feathers with eye spots in the train and male body condition, and the diameter of eye spots and male immunocompetence. If your immune system is operating well, then you have big eyes. Uh, However, they found no consistent relationship among the above descriptors of train elaborateness. Moreover, a a group of French researchers found the peacocks that successfully mated with females were those with more eye spots and shorter trains. Well. For to our knowledge, mate choice based on a male plumage ornament that is under estrogen control is very rare. In Galliform birds, male-like, often showy plumage, including the peacock's train, develops in the absence of estrogen. And conspecific females generally regard these traits in male choices. What that means is if you have bird and you give it estrogen, it will not develop this. It's only if you don't have enough estrogen that these nice uh, things pop out. Uh, Birds have a a different system for sex uh, than than uh, mammals, and they have a W and Z chromosome is what they'll call it, and the females have the two different chromosomes, and the males have the same chromosome, uh, which is interesting. The assumption that higher levels of male hormones may contribute to more elaborate trains. Notice Petri et al is the reference for that. It's an <laughs> assumption is now known to be endocrinologically incorrect. Oops. Sather et al. point out that gathering evidence from a wide range of populations, a long span of observation, and from the perspective of both sexes, will aid in testing the universality and persistence of female preference for a certain male trait, and thus in reconciling differences among previous results. Here we present data from a feral population of Indian peafowl observed over seven years using male and female-centered monitoring for f- further investigation of the role of the male train in mate choice. Our objectives were to determine, one, whether peahens prefer peacocks with longer trains or more ocelli on their trains in this population. Two, whether the symmetry of the ocellar arrangement affects male mating success. We got all the eyes on one side, maybe that spooks the the lady, I don't know, Um, as expected but untested from earlier studies of other populations, uh, again, Petrie expected that, Uh, and which features of the male shivering display using the train affect male mating success. So they're looking not only at the eyes, but they're also looking at a behavioral thing, shivering, which you saw in that video. Methods, general observations. A free-ranging population was observed at Izu Cactus Park um, with those uh, references in uh, Shizuoka, Japan, since 1994. So this has been going on the seven years. They actually quit observing in about 2000. And then they wrote it up, and they finally got it published in 2008. Nobody wanted to hear this. The ratio of adult males older than three years to adult females older than one year uh, ranged from 0.92, and that should be a hyphen. Um, The computer did some strange things, and I didn't catch that, to 1.69. That is to say there's more males than females, indicating the population was generally male-biased. Male mating success... Measures of male morphology, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the, um, uh, and then they did uh, male shivering displays and they did analyses and then the results. All 268 observed matings involved territory male males. And if you didn't line up and elect, you weren't chosen. Um, the most successful male achieved 14.9 to 31.4% of all copulations per year. 
Boy, he had it to himself. One third of the uh, one third of the eggs were his. Uh, thus, mating success was non randomly distributed among territorial males, and there's a you know statistical test, but it's pretty obvious as one male's getting one third of the of the chicks. There's it's skewed. Males who obtained more copulations in one year tended to obtain more in the next year. If you're big time in the first year, you're, you're good. Um, roughly half the females mated multiple times. All monitored females returned to previous males for copulation or courtship. So you liked the guy, you kept going back to him. Um, <clears throat> indicating that they probably used best of end tactics for mate choice. And that's pretty much indisputable. Petrie agrees with that. Male morphology and mate, um, mating set, male train morphology. Males tended to have a similar number of eye spots on their trains compared to that in the previous year. Six pairs on two consecutive years. But this was not the case for the FA index. That's the index of uh, symmetry. So uh, from year to year, that apparently varied. Uh, by the way, peacock tails um, are shed after the mating season, so they're kind of like antlers on a deer in that in that sense. Therefore, display mostly. The relationships among the three train measures were as follows: the number of eye spots showed a negative relation or a trend within the FA index with the FA index in four of seven years, but not in the other three years. So some of the time there was a relationship and some of the time there wasn't. And the train length had no relations with the number of eye spots or with the FA index. Longer train, your number of eye spots didn't increase. Um, population level analysis using all observations across years in uh, GIMMS, GLMMs, Re revealed no significant effects of the three, three train measures on male mating success. Other population level analysis for train measures produced similar results. First, the between the year changes in male train morphology did not result in corresponding changes in male uh, mating success. 24 males that changed their mating status between years did not tend to be successful when they had trains with more eye spots. So if you change the number of eye spots, it didn't mean you uh, were a better bird after that. Uh, other male morphological traits, we observed sexual dimorphism in adult birds, larger size of males during the breeding season, surprise. In all other measured morphological traits except crest length, which apparently stays the same. However, positive correlations of trait values with mating success were rarely observed. One case was for wing length in 1997. The other case was for body weight in 1999. So a bigger bird, maybe you were luckier, but um, uh, or your wings were longer, but the, the tail didn't really matter that much. And no measure consistently showed a specific relation with mating success in more than one year. That had not shown. Skipping on to, well, maybe there's a difference in predation. Comparing the trains of males that survived to those that were predated, uh, killed by animals or whatever, we obtained the following results. No difference in the number of eye spots. Uh, you were just as likely to be killed if you had a short train as a long train. Um, slightly greater FA index in predated individuals. Um, if you're a little lopsided, apparently you were easier to kill. Um, and uh, a zero FA index means you're perfectly symmetrical, for what it's worth. And um, <clears throat> significantly greater length in predated individuals. You're longer, it's easier to catch you, I guess. Or maybe it's harder to fly away, something. Uh, although the sample size of predated individuals was very small, so they are not too confident about that. There was no significant difference in the proportions of predated males that had mated. If you'd had kids, it didn't matter. They could get you anyway. Um, or if you didn't have kids, um, the proportion of surviving males that had mated, uh, indicating that unmated males did not suffer disproportionate predation. Male shivering displays in mating success because we're interested in the tail in the uh, 
things mostly, there's behavioral differences between males. We're going to skip over that. There's behavioral differences. You can find that, that uh, shivering, you can make some uh, statistical uh, comments on. Apparently, it's more important to move that thing than to just have it. Uh, discussion expe uh, effects of male morphology on mating success. PFAL researchers have almost reached a consensus indicating few re effects of male morphological trains, uh, traits other than the train on mating success. Petrie et al. 1991. So Petrie even agrees with that. We're going to come back to Petrie. That's why I'm mentioning him. Um, however, evidence is contradictory for the effects of the number of eye spots and train length. According to our data, the FA of the acellar uh, arrangement showed no consistent relationship with the size of the trait or male mating success, suggesting that this trait is not under directional selection. Peahens don't care if all the eyes are on one side. Well, all the eyes may be, but uh, a significant number of them. Females did not choose males with a combination of more and symmetrically positioned ocelli on the train. In addition, population level analysis in each year indicated that none of the male train measures was a consistent cue of female choice. What is surprising is that two suites of field studies have reached opposite conclusions. Monitoring from the perspective of both sexes has detected a positive effect on male train morphology on mating success in Britain but not in Japan. Increases and decreases in the number of eye spots appear to result in corresponding changes in mating success in Britain, again, Petri, uh, but not in Japan, this study observational. And three, males with longer trains showed better survival, in winter at least, in Britain, but not in the breeding system, season in Japan. Remember, they grew up in India. It is unclear why some researchers have detected both correlation and causality between male and a trainee elaboration and female preferences, whereas others have failed to detect either. One potential factor generating the discord in outcomes among studies and why are we having these disagreements? Um, maybe the difference in observation times. Some previous observations, Petrie et al., Petrie et al., they missed the evening mating period. They weren't looking uh, the whole time. Apparently, the best, best stuff is done at night, uh, during which we recorded 21.1% of all copulations. Um, it's not called the happy hour for nothing. Uh, in a previous study, Petrie et al., peahens that often mated with multiple males on different days were monitored only for a single mating each. Oh, she's mated. Kind of skip her and move on to the next one. On the other hand, we avoided the problem of small effect size due to a small number of observations by conducting a seven-year survey. We took a long time. We then obtained the least effect size from the longest observation with the largest sample size among PFAL studies. Well, one of the most definitive studies because they did it for a long time. Another potential factor may be the age effect. Previous analyses have frequently included measures of trains taken from two- and three-year-old males with regard to male mating success and territory acquisition, condition dependency, or immunocompetence. Notice all Petri studies. However, as these ages, the train measures may not be fully expressed. Although male, well, the young ones don't get as long, well, the young bucks don't get as big antlers either, right? Uh, although male age per se is not likely to be the target of choice, it appears more appropriate to conduct such analysis while making a distinction between four-year-old and younger males because males younger than four years are normally unsuccessful in the feral condition. So the young guys don't get the girls. Uh, positive results are likely to be published and distributed in the research field of sexual selection. However, it is equally important to publish negative results and present a variety of results to, to ensure proper interpretation. Future research should gather... You notice this almost sounds like they're complaining that their study couldn't get published because it had negative results. Um, and present a variety of results to ensure proper interpretation. Further research 
future research should first gather data extensively to reevaluate the universality of female preferences for males with more elaborate trains. This needs to be done because researchers working on specific populations may cons consecutively observe the same relationship, positive, negative, or none, between tra uh, train elaboration and male success, regardless of female precedent preference, because of high between-year constancy in both train elaboration, probably due to genetic background, um, and male success, probably due to female fidelity to previous, previous mates. So, you know, this chick digs you, she kind of dig you for a long time. Um, it is then necessary to elucidate which criteria are used by peahens to assess peacocks trains other than uh, symmetry, for example, volume of shivering noise, total area, overall amount of color, or the density of eye spots. Studies of PFAL vision will be helpful. Can they see these things? Although the visual systems are essentially identical among galliform birds, including the absence of UV-sensitive visual pigments. They can't see the ultraviolet. Uh, despite considerable and interspecific variation in plumage coloration. You can change the color, but if the birds can't see it, it doesn't matter. We may have failed to detect mate choice based on the male train that actually occurred in our population for unknown reasons. Maybe some strange thing and we just missed it. If we did, then the male train does not necessarily indicate male quality because equivocal evidence describes the cost or condition dependency of its expression. Effects of male shivering display on mating success, we'll skip over that. Uh, what factors affect male uh, mating success? We'll skip over that. Phylogenetic inferences for evolution of sex differences in Indian peafowl. The CVs of peacock trains and non-ornamental tail feathers did not differ in our population. Other than those beautiful feathers, they don't look any different. Suggesting that train length is not currently under directional selection. In addition, peacock-like plumage is inhibited by a high level of female hormones. You have female hormones, you can't make the, the tail. Suggesting that there has been selection on females for dull-colored plumage. In other words, they were originally all beautiful, and now the females are dull-colored because they have to to survive. As would be expected in ground-nesting species with little or no male parental care, where females suffer high predation risk during incubation. Peans were actually twice as vulnerable as males in our population. 24 female versus 11 male bir adult birds were predated during our study, killed by animals. Um, even though the sex ratio of the population was generally male bias, there are more males, but the females got killed easier. More of them got killed. Conclusion. Combined with pre previous results, our findings indicate that the peacock strain is not currently the universal target of female choice, shows small variance among males across population, does not appear to be to reliably reflect male condition and for is perhaps ancestral and static rather than recently derived. It's been there for a long time, it hasn't changed. Maybe since their creation? Oh, uh, hush my mouth. Um, nevertheless, this train is thought to have evolved and to function for almost exclusi exclusively epigamic purposes and is thought to be a necessary condition for successful reproduction. Well, it is kind of, but you know, if you, any old tale will work it for you. They all work pretty well. Combining these considerations, we propose that the peacock strain is an obsolete signal for which female preferences have already been lost or weakened. weakened. You see, because you've got to have it somewhere. It happened way, way back in the past where you can't reproduce it now. The present is not the key to the past. but which has nonetheless been maintained up to the present because it is required as a threshold cue to achieve stimulatory levels in females before mating and or it is maintained as an unreliable cue. Peahens probably use the male trait in their mate choice sequence but we should not necessarily assume that the male trait is a costly and or informative cue. Use of uninformative cues can be beneficial for females for example through facilitation of mate detection. So. These people are not creationists. They just think that the evidence doesn't show that peahens care anymore. As long as you got one, 
They don't care how big it is or how beautiful it is or how symmetrical or anything. Um, birds in which male-like plumage develops in the absence of estrogen, four, four birds, and the galliforms are them, uh, it is typical for existing male ornaments to be unreliable fisher traits or traits that do not attract females. See the introduction. On the other hand, females could shift their attention from obsolete signals to more informative signals, as we observed peahens exercising best act, uh, active best of N choice, presumably on some trait other than the male's train. What does uh, best of N mean? You see 10 guys, and uh, uh, guy 7 is the best. I'll go with him. Researchers of sexual selection have focused their interest largely on the question of why, but not how, only males have elaborate trains in this species. The endocrinological basis and phylogenetic inferences for the peacock's train coincidentally caution against the conventional attitude of unidirectional presumption that greater plumage ornamentation in males is always the most recently derived condition. Apparently not. The sight of the peacock's tail makes me sick. Remember that quote? Although we have come far in some ways since Darwin's writing, it is too early to regard his question as settled until the whole evolutionary track of diversification in peacock's displays has been revealed by integrated perspectives of physiologic, physiology, phylo, phylogeny, and field ecology. So there's a lot of work to be done. And they know what they're working at. And that's why their paper can't be published easily is because it goes against Darwin. Well, there was an answer right away. Loyal A. et al. And as I recall, um, uh, our other guy is, uh, is uh, the second author of this. Do peahens not prefer peacocks with more elaborate trains? In other words, he's turned the statement of the last one into a question. This is an animal behavior um, 76 E, E5 to E9, I guess that's electronic. And again, you can get this on the internet. And this is interesting because remember the other paper? It took uh, years to do the study, a few years to write it up, uh, and then uh, over a year to get it published. These guys got theirs on the 17th, they wrote their thing on the 17th of June. The initial exception was on the 9th of July. The final acceptance was the 23rd of July, less than a month from their initial acceptance. Published online on the 7th of September. They moved this one through. Ever since Darwin, the peacock strain has been cited as the icon of an extravagant, conspicuous secondary sexual trait that has evolved through female mate choice. However, Takahashi et al. recently challenged this idea. They monitored female mate choice, that's the paper we just read, of course, through seven years in feral peafowl population in Japan and found no correlation between male mating success and three morphological tra train traits. They concluded that combined with previous results, our findings indicate that the peacock's train is not currently the universal target of female choice and proposed that the peacock's train is an obsolete signal for which female preferences has already been lost or weakened. We feel their conclusions are far too strong, particularly since three independent studies have found a relationship between uh, train features and mating success. Yes, the second author is Petrie. So this is Petrie's answer to the previous paper. The purpose of this article is therefore to draw attention to alternative explanations and conclusions that are essential for the understanding of the complexity of mate choice. We first suggest some possible non-adaptive and adaptive explanations for the reported differences in female preferences in the peafowl. We then show that plasticity in mate choice is a widespread phenomenon across a large spectrum of species. We, therefore, we suggest that findings based on a single population, as in Japan, can be misleading if generalized to the whole species. The peacock's train is a complex structure that cannot be summarized with only three morphologic traits, number of eye spots, train symmetry, and train length. Oh, what do they want? Two previous studies show that the density and the coloration and iridescence of eye spots in the trains have the potential to be involved in mate choice. 
Loyal, of course, you'll notice, is the first author. Consequently, Takahashi et al. cannot discard the possibility that they did not measure elements of the signal most relevant for female mate choice. They weren't looking at the density. They were looking at some other things that didn't show. Their main concern was the absence of correlations between the number of eye spots and mating success consistent over the seven years of their study. One explanation for this absence of correlation could be that, in the Japanese population, the train, contain, train contains a trait preferred by the females that is not always positively correlated with the number of eye spots. Hence, it would, be, it would not be possible to detect whether the tra train contains a signal under sexual selection. On the basis of their results, Takahashi et al. also concluded that the train symmetry and train length were not co components of the signal received by the females. However, does that mean that no signal exists? More recently, a correlational study suggested the females may use eye spot densities in the train. Uh, Loyal uh, notice is one of the uh, authors of that paper rather than the number of eye spots. So it's not how many there are, it's whether there's a whole bunch of them close together. Um, perhaps because this feature is more quickly assessed. This finding is not inconsistent with the fact that experimentally reducing the number of eye spots in the train decreased mating success. You clip off a few feathers and apparently it doesn't work as well. Is that because it makes less noise? I don't know. Uh, since by removing eye spots, Petrie and Holiday also reduced the eye spot density. Petrie et al. found positive correlations between eye spot number, train length, and mating success, although the relationship between eye spot number and train length was negative in a sample of uh, cold birds from one lek, all shot on the same day because of a change of paddock. I don't know what happened there. Uh, it doesn't sound too good for the peacocks. Uh, peahens, Takahashi, and colleagues may be able to... T uh, I'm sorry, peahens doesn't belong there. Takahashi and colleagues may be able to test for an effective eye spot density since they measured the number of eye spots and the train length of 24 peacocks for t three years. This would be a valuable addition to our understanding of how the various components of the signal in the male train affects female mate choice. So maybe if they combine their eye spots and train length, uh, they would get a better signal according to... Uh, Loyal et al. Takahashi discussed the discordance between studies and suggested that missed observations of mating and small sample sizes of previous studies may play a part, claiming that their study had the longest observation with the largest sample size among peafowl studies. We agree that the number of copulations observed is critical to a meaningful analysis of variance in mating success. However, Takahashi et al. saw only 206 copulations in seven years, which amounts to about 38 copulations per annum from 20 to 37 territorial males observed in any one year. In contrast, Petrie and Holiday, that's us, saw 116 copulations in one year uh, instead of 38 uh, from observations of 30 territorial males, almost three times as many. We suspect the difference in the number of copulations observed may be caused by a difference in population size and, in particular, the number of reproductively active hands observed. Remember, these guys, uh, uh, the Takahashi et al., had uh, more males than females. Um, the Japanese study reported a total population of 75 to 104 birds. Again, uh, interesting uh, electronics there which Takahashi et al. stated is male-biased, whereas the whipsnade population was estimated at 179 birds. Unfortunately, watching the same small population for a number of years does not overcome the problem of error associated with small sample size, as the dependent variable is the number of copulations per male per annum. The possibility, therefore, remains that there may be insufficient observations of copulations to detect an effect in the Japanese study. In other words, they maybe had too small a study. Should have done it for more years. There are other possible explanations for the discordance between studies, including uncontrolled variation as a result of small methodological differences. For example, train length was measured in early spring in f France during the peak mating period at Whipsnide in Britain, Petrie, and from the beginning of, to the peak of the mating season in Japan. And there's a bunch of other stuff that's sort of similar to that. You can read it 
if you're that interested. Apart from the obvious po problem that feral populations of peafowl do not undergo the same selection pressure as the wild populations, these populations were established outside the original distribution range of the species. Well, of course, all of them were, including the ones in Great Britain and France, usually using a small number of individuals which could have created a strong genetic bottleneck. So maybe they're actually different populations. Yeah, probably. Reasons for the discrepancy between Takahashi et al.'s results and previous studies may not only reflect differences in methodology. There are several other explanations for what might be called plastic female choice. Sometimes they choose, sometimes they don't. Indeed, divergence in behavior among populations of a given species is widespread. Skipping over a, another uh, paragraph, taken together these examples highlight the fact that great caution is required when generalizing results from a single population to the whole set of populations of a given species, as already pointed out by Madden and Forstmeyer et al., in the light of previous work by three independent groups on three independent populations of peafowl, um, showing an influence of train elaboration and mate choice, it is thus rather surprising that in their conclusion, Takahashi et al. proposed that the peacock's train is an obsolete signal for which female preference has already been lost or weakened. They can't make that conclusion. Takahashi et al. challenged the idea that peacock's train might be an indicator of good genes, despite strong evidence supporting that hypothesis, all from P Petrie and uh, Loyal. Petrie in press. They asserted that since the peafowl is a galliform bird, the train is likely to develop in the absence of estrogen and consequently is unlikely to be an indicator of male quality. Therefore, they expected females to discard this trait in mate choice. According to Takahashi et al., the female preference for the male's train is supposed to have been lost or weakened. If so, it implies that this preference existed at some point and thus may still exist. So Darwin was right after all. Uh, eye spots have independently evolved in several taxa, birds and butterflies, and it is likely that such a train origi uh, trait originally evolved through the exploitation of a sensory bias. Um, which would also account for the hypnotic effect of the train on peahens described by Ridley et al. So, you see, they evolved, and that means that it has to have a function. Um, otherwise, Darwin would be wrong. The coexistence of the heritability of female preference the, through the sensory bias and the heritability of the train's development provides strong support for the idea that the train evolved through Fisher's runaway process. According to this scenario, the train has evolved as a fisherian trait and is maintained as a good genes indicator, whatever the hormonal control. We don't care that it was the original. In other Galliform species, the development of the train may never have reached the threshold, leading to a loss of ornamental traits. You see, all the other Galliform birds, yeah, they're right. They don't care. But peacocks, they do care, because Darwin said, and Darwin was right. <coughs> um, Therefore, we do not see why the form of hormonal control of train expression negates previous findings and know of no evidence to suggest why it should. The peahens may appear to be quite exceptional if they indeed select mates based on the male train. However, the existence of secondary sex ornaments and display behaviors as complex and extravagant as the peacock's train and display is itself already exceptional. So there's got to be a Darwinian explanation. To conclude, we agree with Takahashi et al. that it is important to publish negative results and hopefully further such studies will be published so that a more meaningful meta-analysis can be carried out. However, the failure to detect evidence of mate choice in one study based on a limited array of traits does not mean that females do not prefer males with more elaborate trains, or at least that they didn't in the past. Only a very strict experimental study across several captive and wild populations could demonstrate that. To date, only one study on peafowl mate choice has been done in the wild, and unfortunately the number of eye spots was not recorded. Further studies of wild populations with natural levels of genetic variations will be particularly useful in extending our understanding of peahen mating preferences. Whoa, that was a lot. In looking at the references that cited the original irritating study, um, 
I ran into a couple of them that are of note. Most of them just kind of take it and run with it. Um, this one is uh, infrasound. And the abstract, I'll just read the first part. Infrasound, uh, male peak foul display to females with erection and movement of their elaborately ornamented train. I'm not sure why that says infrasound there. We hypothesize that the male's concave train serves as a radiator of acoustic signals and thus examine both the production and perception of acoustic signals associated with these displays in Indian peafowl. And don't ask me why Christatus is not italicized. It wasn't in the uh, original, or at least what's available online. We discovered that male train displays produced infrasonic signals which were perceived by both male and female peafowl. So what's really going on is this big display is making sounds that you can't hear. Well, if that's the case, then who cares how many eyes are on it? Nature.com, size doesn't always matter for peacocks. This is another follow-up, and unfortunately, I discovered this late enough that I couldn't go back to the original, although for time purposes, it's probably better that I don't. Peahens don't necessarily choose the males with the biggest tails, but small tails are right out. It's uh, written by Ewan Calloway, and it's in the, in the news section, which is why you can get it online. The sight of a feather in, feather in a peacock's tail, Charles Arwen wrote in 1860, makes me sick. Why, they just keep coming back to that, don't they? The seemingly useless, even cumbersome, gaudy plumage did not fit with his theory of natural selection. Yep, that's right. In which traits that helped to secure survival are passed on. But Darwin eventually made peace with the peacock strain, and its plumage has become the poster child for his theory of sexual selection, in which ostensibly useless traits can evolve when they are preferred by choosy females. You like lipstick on your girl? They'll all put on lipstick, I guess. Um, in recent years, however, a furious debate has emerged among behavioral ecologists over whether the train of the male peafowl still woos peahens. Research in which the peacock's tails were experimentally plucked, published online, online this month in animal behavior, now suggests that the answer is yes, but only sometimes. So if you pull out the tail, why they don't mate. There are other things that we think are going into that decision, says Russell and Dakin. Um, Dakin and a colleague, uh, Robert Montgomery, tracked three populations of fear, feral peacocks and peahens during the spring breeding season when, hopefully male, when hopeful males stage elaborately choreographed routines for picky females. They found that males with very few eye spots in their tail feathers a measure of the size of the tail, were unattractive to females, but males with more spots than average had no advantage. You have enough, it's enough. Size matters up to a point, and then after that, so what? Um, eyeing the evidence, beginning in 1980, Marion Petrie, you remember Petrie, a behavioral ecologist at Newcastle University, UK, examined the roles of the peacock's tail in mating ritual's. I started to work on peacocks because Darwin had suggested it and nobody had gone out and tested the idea, she says. Apparently a lady. As she expected, Petrie found, as she expected, we found what we were looking for, found that males with the most eye spots were also the most successful with females. Plucking feathers from a male's train ruined his chances. Later French scientists found that males with lots of eye spots had stronger immune systems than less showy males, suggested that the trait is an indicator of a male's fitness. Skipping over, however, in 2008, a team of Japanese ecologists studying the same group of feral peafowl over seven years reported that overall, females didn't seem to favor males with the largest, most symmetrical tails. We propose that the peacock strain is an obsolete signal for which female preference has already been lost or weakened, wrote Mariko Takahashi at the University of Tokyo and her colleagues. That paper garnered widespread media coverage, including attention from creationists who were delighted to see Darwin questioned. Hmm, wonder why. Petrie and the French scientists published a rebuttal. We cannot let this stand. I think everyone would agree that things are more complex than Takahashi et al. conclude, says Dakin, whose own studies were underway when that paper came out. Dakin repeated Petrie's experimental work by plucking the feathers of peacocks. 
she noticed a drop in their success with peahens. However, she also found that before plucking, males typically had between 165 and 170 eye spots on their train, and on average, those with the most eye spots didn't mate any, any more than males with the, lex, uh, with the less extravagant tails. You got enough, you got enough. Petrie is glad to see her experiments repeated, but is not convinced that the natural variation in the number of eye spots on a tail is so small. Uh, still, Petrie admits that traits such as the number of eye spots are only rough measures of tail quality and probably mean more to scientists than to peahens. <laughs> at the end of the day, we will never know what peahens are looking for, looking at, and how they select their mates. You can't ask them. Well, and then just to make sure that I hadn't missed something obvious, uh, obviously there's another study that, you know, where they pulled out feathers and, and uh, saw what happened. Um, in their 2013 study, Dakin and Montgomery learned that eye spot color accounted for almost half of the peacock mating success. And the iridescence of the blue-green eye spot is the most important eye color variable. So what's really happening is how beautiful the eyes are, not how many of them there are. The researchers also experimentally manipulated the eye spots on nine peacocks and reported that mating success plunged to zero, supporting the notion that peahens attend to eye spots. So you can't paint those things. The bronze gold eye spot and the purple black eye spot have a minimal effect on mating. It's that blue thing in the center, I guess. Uh, just for fun, there is a peacock. This is a uh, national bird of India, interestingly. And um, uh, there he is in full display. And you can see, for some reason, the T's aren't showing very well. Uh, oh, there's a peacock. Green this time. So apparently they come in different colors at times, although blue is by far the most common. And there's one that uh, is kind of almost looks like a dragon there. Um, and how's that one for color? with the red eyes now. I wonder whether that one gets any girls. <laughs> so you can get all kinds of peacocks. Anyway, <clears throat> and uh, take a look at those, uh, those eye spots. Notice that the little strands that come out have to change from blue to light blue to gold and apparently if you go out far enough to yellow. And then they can do whatever they want to after that. Try to imagine how you would genetically make that thing work. Now, my own take on it, I think peacock feathers are objectively beautiful. Uh, somebody comes back and says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well. That's not, that's a half-truth. There is, in fact, high inter-observer agreement. I mean, practically everybody agrees that Mozart is beautiful, that Rembrandt is beautiful, that sunsets are beautiful, okay? In fact, peacock feathers are a good illustration. They made Darwin sick. But they didn't make him sick because they're not beautiful. They made him sick precisely because they're beautiful. You see, this is arguably an acquired distaste. The fact of the matter is we were meant to enjoy peacocks. Okay, if they have no survival value, then they either have to be sexually selective or else Darwin, by his own admission, is dead. Or at least the all-encompassing Darwin is dead. Thus the attempt to say that they are attractive to females. And you see these people running their studies and finding in contrast to other galliforms where the females don't care. If you got enough, you got enough. Well, apparently, if you have peacocks, if you got enough, you got enough. But they don't want to acknowledge that. There is reasonable evidence that they are not, beyond a certain point, they're not attractive to females. This just simply cannot be allowed to stand. It challenges Darwin directly. This branch of science does not appear to be completely objective. Now, whatever attraction the tails are to females does not appear to be enough to overcome genetic entropy, let alone create those beautiful eye spots. 
How do you how do you make the eye spots when the when the the females say, "Oh, that's a big enough one." Yeah, what? How can you shake it? Um, but we will not truly know until we have the genetic code for eye spots. Obviously, there is one, and can see how simple or complicated it is. Now, there is a worthy research project. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, Sean. Do you think it might be a combination of both? Because complex traits uh, can be enhanced or decreased. Like uh, you can change the morphology of, of a finch. You can make bigger beaks, smaller beaks, fatter beaks, thinner beaks, all these things. But the basic structure of the beak is the same. Same with dogs, big dogs, little dogs, long snout dogs, short snout dogs. All these things can be changed by natural selection uh, without basically by shuffling around genes that already exist. So you're not really creating anything new. You're just shuffling around the gene pool. And it's possible to do this with, I would say, I bet you could uh, artificially do it quite easily with selective breeding of peacocks, that you could change the size and shape of the tail and even the color, like you, there's a bunch of different colors of peacocks, uh, and you can select for all of that uh, quite easily based on just shuffling the gene pool around uh, of pre-existing genes. But where Darwin is wrong, I mean, that part is right. You, if the peacock hens... Uh, could select for these different traits just like humans could do. They could establish very different looking peacocks over time, including peacocks without tails at all, um, because it's easier to go downhill than uphill. Yes, yes. However, and, and in or, fact, what's interesting is that the females apparently have an add on to get rid of all that fancy stuff. Right. In fact, it may be detrimental to get too many eyes. It right? raises because that an may... interesting question of whether the original had both sexes beautiful right. and flashing you could, you each could other. You could do that, and then the females lost theirs. And the females lost theirs because they have to stay with the eggs, and then the, and then the, then the foxes get them. But where the problem for Darwin comes in is explaining the, the origin of the genes that allows this to happen to begin with. That's where you can't. Selection just doesn't create novel genes. You have to get random mutations to get there right, in the first yeah. place. And if you, you know, if it's a flipping a coin twice, okay. So you know, eight times, I I could buy that. Right, but these, but if it's like these feathers, you know, fifty thousand times, eh, the nature of these feathers and their structures and their colors—that's a complex genetic process. You're just not going to get that by flipping a coin a couple times. Yeah. So anyway. This approach is not new to me. My my degree was in animal behavior, and I did a sexual study. Uh, it was with fish, stream minnows, and it was a very instructive for me at the beginning. That is, what your 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 experimental design is dictated by the questions you ask. I had an upcoming uh, faculty appointment. I had to get out and get done with my research, but I could not find the male effect on this female dream minnow that led to more breeding. And I was really, really frustrated. So finally one day I threw away, I, had, I won't go into the details, I had a lot of apparatus to evaluate what the female quote saw. It was mainly looking at the effect of the sound the male made on the female. And so I finally stepped back and said, just what's going on behaviorally? And I found that when I played back the sound artificially, the female quit swimming around and settled. Duh. So, so you play back the sound and the, and the female stops and listens and... Give me an opportunity to be able to come in court. Otherwise, she's running away from the male all the time. So, so it uh, depends on whether you can sing or not, whether they... 
good way, good way of putting it. But anyway, it's uh, it is amazing that the quality of the Japanese research seems to be very high. Its big problem is it doesn't agree with the conclusions of the rest of the community. Yes, so and you, disagrees with Darwin you, himself. You can get, you can get published. Darwin, got, you, that's heresy. You can get published in two days if you, or pardon me, two months if you agree with Darwin, but you'll take two years. More than and two years, ma- because remember, they finished and, the data. And, and, and many attempts to discredit your work because it doesn't fit the bias. That's a real description of good science. <laughs> I might continue then. I had a similar complaint on a much more recent paper in which, and I won't go into details, but the reviewer said, uh, your results don't agree with what I expect them to be. So therefore, I don't believe in your techniques. Well, you got the wrong answer, so you must have done it wrong. Precisely. Uh, if, however, he opened himself to a very easy answer, and that was, well, you know, evolution is so plastic, I can give you any proposition I choose to, and it, <laughs> and it might make you happy, and it might not. <laughs> Other comments, or are we just stunned by the beauty of the whole thing? Uh, uh, yes? We just heard from Jack. Uh, I'm curious about seagull studies up in Morseman State, um, Joe Galusha and different ones, uh, Hayward. Um, is it sight attraction or is it sound attraction? You brought in sound as a factor, or is it both? Well, the seagulls, it clearly was both. Yes. That's and my guess. We could manipulate either feature and change the yeah. behavior. My, my question is, the question isn't necessarily, and that's why I think this is a flawed research on both sides, is that uh, it doesn't really matter what the what the hens select for. The, the, what matters is that you can change the selection at will. Yeah, you can do it human wise, do the human selection of these peacocks and change anything you want at will, dramatically. So it doesn't really matter what the hens select for. It matters how you can change the genetics of a creature based on any kind of selection, morphologic selection, uh, about what's expressed phenotypically. And you can change uh, these peacocks dramatically if you did that uh, based on human selection, just like human breeders change dogs, cats, roses, fish, anything you can dream of. Dramatic changes can be achieved by uh, phenotypic selection. And so it doesn't really matter. It's the wrong question. What do the peacock hen select for? That doesn't matter. It matter. What matters from a Darwinian's perspective is what's possible based on selection alone. And what's possible is dramatic, uh, but it doesn't really save Darwin in the end, right? Because you can select for all kinds of things, but it's just based on this plasticity of an underlying gene pool that allows for these phenotypic variations that we even see in peacocks. Uh, dramatic changes in color and size and shape and form and all kinds of things. But but it doesn't really save Darwin because that's all largely Mendelian and, and that, that messed up. Dar- Darwin Darwin and Mendel existed at the same time, but I strongly believe that if Mendel had become famous first, that Darwin had had a much harder time. So, anyway. And maybe the reason why Mendel didn't become famous is because his theories didn't uh, comport with the times as well as Darwin's did. Right. I, I think everything was really open for Darwin politically at the time. Yeah. Um, but somehow Mendel didn't become well-known until after Darwin. So, Yes. You, you have a comment? I mean, I've got to ask, what, uh, what is this poor guy doing sitting out in the field for seven years? <laughs> you know, okay, I, I saw him eating there. I mean, how do they, how do, they do this? Graduates of students will do anything for a degree. <laughs> for seven years, well... <laughs> Maybe there was two waves of graduate students. Okay. And you know, one took the first three years. Well, what do you do for a living? Well, <laughs> I watch peacocks having fun. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was just thinking, um, if it was me, I'd like set up a camera and like 
review it and fast forward or something like that. I mean, I yeah, don't but know. you have to remember this is 1995. It's not quite so easy to set up a camera and review right. it. Right. So. Uh, just raising the question of how could this gradually develop? Uh, this is not an easy design you have there. You've got a yellow circle around the outside, and you have a blue circle, a uh, dark circle, and the light blue circle, and then the dark circle inside, and so on. Uh, how could random changes produce something that design? Well, in order to answer that question, we would really need to ha have some clue as to which specific uh, genes are necessary to code for this. Not you know, sure. if, if, you, if it takes one change in one gene, yeah, oh. I'd buy that. If it takes 20 concerted changes with 18 of them needing to be done before the other two even started making a difference, oh. then you're into irreducible complexity territory. Just a minute. We we want to catch you. Uh, ju just a comment. <laughs> uh, the generally behavioral theory, if you want to stick in t theory, would predict that the tail should be simplified because it costs too much energy to generate that complex a signal. And uh, behind the discussion you read, I was listening to, but, but, but this shouldn't be. <laughs> because can you think of a much more costly energetically and functionally signal to present a female with than this? When one red spot in the middle of a forehead had been a lot simpler and just as inform informationally rich? So it really illustrates to me, I've always been bothered by these energy suppositions. You know, this has to be right because theoretically we believe it reduces the energy cost. And somehow the animals don't listen. Yeah. yeah the beginning had to be the most, the most complex. The beginning gene pool had to have the most complex well, starting point. You're sounding like a creationist, though. Yeah, I know. Well, the Darwin, the, I mean, Dawkins himself. Uh, Richard Dawkins, he always talks about these little crabs in Japan where uh, the crab fishers, when they caught them, if on the back of the pattern looked like a samurai, they would throw them back in. And so pretty soon all those ones that survived looked like samurais on the back. And that's, that's, a, real, uh, that's a real evolutionary uh, uh, selective advantage, I guess, to look like a samurai in Japan. So, um, and that happened. I mean, that really happened. And you're like, wow, how does that happen? Uh, well, again, I think the original gene pool had to allow for, for this variability in patterns, and then the selected pattern always uh, took an advantage. So I'm not necessarily saying that shape, that particular little shape thing can't be changed. I'm sure it can be uh, changed. It's just that the, gen the original genetics had to be complex enough to allow for that. Otherwise, it, otherwise, like you said, it would just go downhill. Well, as a matter that. of fact, we have lots of examples of going downhill. Yeah. Um, uh, polar bears being one of the best. Um, and one of these days we're going to get Darwin Duvall's written up. Because yeah, polar uh, bears are and, cool, right? Because they, they have hollow hairs that, that function like fiber optics because the skin is black. Uh, but originally, I think the genetics would have allowed for bears in general to uh, to uh, to well, uh, gain uh, that feature. Brown was first. Yeah, right. And and white is a mutation. Right, right. The white part is the degenerative loss mutation. Of, loss of function. Right. And so is their ability to eat seal blubber. Uh, it turns out that there are a number of different adaptations yeah. on. Because being on a vegetarian is much more complex than being a meat eater. Yeah. As far as your digestive system, so well, everything's had to start out vegetarian and then degrade yeah. down. Yeah. You have to figure there. out how to throw away all that cholesterol and stuff. You know. That's why lions eating straw like an ox, described in the Bible, well, that's a more complex feature than their current state. Originally, the, being vegetarian lion was a lot more complex than just going out and catching the gazelle. So. <laughs> As far as your digestive system is concerned. I mean, cows have to have four stomachs to do it, right? 
So, and a lot of extra enzymes and things. So. Well, next year, uh, next week, unless we have uh, further comments, why we'll we'll look at the Pope and uh, climate change and. Um, Oh, you want to do no? Uh, you can do one next week, and then I'll do one the week after. So, uh, Sean's got the floor for next week, and now you got to tell me what it is so that I can put it in. Can I email it to you? Sure. Okay. See you around.